Hi there, my name is Lee Mottersed and I have a confession to make. Never in my now many centuries as a racing journalist have I known a week in which there were so many major news stories breaking in the course of such a short time. And in this particular edition of The Front Page, we will be discussing those stories. And the we who will be doing the discussing are myself and my esteemed colleagues, Mr. Peter Scargill and Mr. Chris Cook. I've never known a week like it. Pete, have you known a week like it? No, and I've known a lot of weeks like mm. you. I'm a veteran of this mm. um, industry. So no, it was, uh, it was remarkable. It was one punch after the other through the whole week, wasn't it? It was. Mm. Chris, unprecedented? Uh, probably. Yeah. Uh, I haven't done my homework on that one, I must admit. No. There were some weeks when, uh, I don't know if you remember, we would sometimes show up at the Old Bailey. Um, oh, yeah, and those, various yeah. racing people would be called as witnesses. And, you know, th there were some quite fruity headlines in those times. But we've, yeah. I think we've collectively agreed to kind of draw a veil, haven't yes. we, and move on. So, yes. so yeah, our... biggest week since then, anyway. Yeah, so collectively, none of us have known a week like it. And we'll be discussing that week in a second. But before we do, the Racing Post app has changed the way in which we present you race cards. They now look very, very exciting indeed. More on that here. You spoke. We listened. Introducing race cards redefined. Three brand new and unique race cards tailored for your needs. Our new and improved standard race card is the punter's favourite and is everything you need to make your selection. Get the maximum amount of information in the palm of your hand with expert view. Cover all areas and get all the same information as our newspaper. With Compact View, you can make a quick decision on who to back. View more runners and more odds on one race. Which race card will you choose? So we are going to crack off this week with the world's most famous horse race, undoubtedly the signature horse race for the sport in this part of the world. That is the Grand National and in April 2024, Chris Cook, it is going to look a bit different. Yeah, we're going to have maximum 34 runners from now on. Um, it, it, to a lot of people it might not look all that different. I, I feel really sad about it. Um, not just the outcome, um, but the way it's, it's been gone about. Um, so I got into um, racing and the Grand National back in 1984, which um, just so happens to have been the year when they last cut the safety limit for the national from 50 runners down to 40. That wasn't really a cut, that was more of an acceptance of reality because they, they hadn't even been getting 40 for some of the races in the 15 years that led up yeah. to that decision. Um, and in fact, that was a great time for the race because the jockey club were heroes. They just paid the property developer something like 3.4 million, which was worth having in 1984, yeah. to buy Aintree and save the race. Um, and, and, and I still feel very positively about the Jockey Club in terms of what they do for horse racing. I mean, amazing things, really. Um, all the race courses are well run, and Lambert and Newmarket are amazing places because of their investment. Um, but they do sometimes play a bit fast and loose with the sports heritage we saw with Kempton a few years ago, which is another thing that people have uh, agreed to kind of forget. They, they did suddenly put out a press release, if you remember, saying, we're going to build on Kempton and we're going to use the money to invest in Newmarket. And that hasn't happened, um, but it, it, you know, I was reminded of that last week when we suddenly got this press release going, by the way, six runners less in the Grand National from now on. Um, the BHA led uh, quite a detailed review into the Grand National a dozen years ago, um, which produced a 55-page report, a really sort of serious bit of work, mm. when, amongst other things, they looked at, should we cut the field size for the Grand National? Um, and they looked at footage of every faller and every unseat from 2000 to 2011 in the races involving professional jockeys over the national fences and concluded that there was really no cause to say that you know, cutting the field size was going to make any difference. They, they reckoned that you know, none of those horses had really been unsighted um, and fewer runners was, would not have prevented what happened to them from happening. Um, then we get this press release last week, as I say, a jockey club-led initiative on this occasion. It seems like we're in a different era with the BHA. 
they're not asserting the kind of control that they did over the sport back in those days. This is more the sort of Julie Harrington, Lacey Fair hands off issue. The Jockey Club have been allowed to sort of run this show themselves. And again, we've just suddenly got this press release saying this is what we're going to do. And, and not, nothing like as much shown in the way of working out. No. Um, you know, there's, there's no data that you can interrogate. There's no sort of detailed reasoning. They're just saying, well, this is what we decided after a review of various things. And this is what we're going to do. Um, and it's unlike the Kempton thing, where it just didn't happen over a period of years. This is something that will happen, and there's nothing you can do about it. And it will never be reversed, um, because once you cut the number of runners in the race, like the Grand National, you're never going to be allowed to put them back up again. I just don't think that's something that any official would ever contemplate. You're losing a great deal. And we're in an era of super trainers now, where uh, you know they're, they're just becoming more and more dominant, and nothing is being done to tackle that, so it will only go on being more and more the case. Um, and if you cut runners out of a race like the Grand National, it's going to be easier for the big time trainers to dominate. And the incentive is right there because it's a huge prize money race. So we're losing the sort of interesting, colourful stories that sometimes sneak in at the bottom of the field. Um, horses like Manella Times that gave Rachel Blackmore her success. Foynaven wouldn't have got into the race if it had been 34 runners. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I fear that they, you know, we're going to get some unintended consequences. One of which I think will be that um, the race loses some of its colour, loses some of its popular appeal. But it's going to be very hard in the long run to separate out whatever happens to the race. Um, you know, it's going to be hard to attribute that to particular causes because they're doing other things as well. There are other changes that are happening. Um, and there will always be sort of that ability to argue about, oh, well, yes, it's declined in popularity, but that's because, because, mm -hmm. because. I think, you know, in the long run, this, this is not going to be good news for the races standing with the public. This is going to diminish its popular appeal. Um, it certainly makes the idea of the national in the future less attractive to me as a fan of the sport and as a punter. Um, I mean, I, I obviously I respect absolutely the motivation that they want to do things to improve safety and to get the animal rights law off our case. Um, but I, I, I fear that this is going to be damaging to the race itself and ineffective in terms of promoting safety. Mm. Loads of points to pick up there. Um, I suppose just, just on one point in terms of the animal rights law, I suppose the jockey club would say that they're not really aiming any of this at the extreme end of the animal rights. I mean, they're, they're, um, they have to say that. Yeah. But I think realistically, you know, historians 50 years from now are going to put those two things together, aren't they? They're going to mm. say there was this you enormous can't, protest. You can't, you can't separate the two regardless yeah. how you, you try and right. okay. think what you say. 118 people arrested, race delayed, and all of the all of the links around that. You, you, I, I think precisely can't. because of that, if, if I was running the show, I'd be saying, well, look, you know, we don't do things just because guys invade our course and break the law. Um, you know, we, we're not going to be changing stuff just because they mm. say so. I think I think this would have been a really good time to sort of show some strength, show some show some faith in the race, yeah. and say, you know, we're, uh, for at least one more year, we're going to run it as it was, because. There was a real sense, I think, in April that that protest affected what happened afterwards. You know, the, there was a kind of a rush to get the race started. You know, well, so I mean, Sandy Thompson said, didn't he? His, his, his was got hyper, Hill 16 yeah. got hyper in, uh, and the first two or three fences, maybe even four fences, were pretty messy, weren't they? They were, oh, they were God, an unpleasant it, it, watch. It, it, it was difficult to watch, but I, I think that must have been affected to some degree by what happened. So then you try and have a normal national next year and respond to that, I think, rather than the, yeah. the outlier. Anyway, we are where we are. Bef just before we pick up some of the points relating to the reduced field size, in general terms, is it fair to say that there seems to be a consensus opinion that in, the, in terms of the other significant headline changes, bring the first fence close to the start, bringing the off time forward, uh, standing start, shaving a bit off that um, the ditch beyond Valentine's. That there's generally been yeah. consensus that okay, yeah, we think these are good ideas. Is that fair? I, I think that is fair. I mean, I think not everybody's saying that they're all going to work, but they're yeah, they're but, definitely worth trying. Okay. But so, then some people are saying, and I, this is something I have some time for. If you try to do all of these things at once and then it goes well or it goes badly, you know, well, you how do you attribute the yeah, cause? Absolutely. You know, what's working yeah. and what's not. That's a fair point. Um, Pete, in, in terms of the reduced field size, so initially on Thursday I was feeling pretty despondent to an extent. 
Um, and I was feeling ever more that the Grand National needed luck on its side going forward, which I think is still the case. Yeah. But then you, I don't know, I, I suppose I, I looked and read of what a lot of people said and I was struck by, as I said in the column today, I can't think of many issues that have divided what I would call the sports most, sports most sensible thinkers. You know, the, the, there's people that you respect saying one thing and people you respect saying completely the other. Um, and I, I suppose on, on reflection, I'm, I'm thinking that going forward, um, Will people really notice a difference between 40 and 34? If the Grand National is the one race that attracts an audience way beyond mm. our sport, you know, if you were asking those people that only watch horse racing once a year, um, that only bet on horse racing once a year, and you'd said to them, how many runners in the Grand National? Would they have known it was 40? Will they know it's 34 this year? Will that impact them? Will they, uh, would they have noticed in 1996 when only 27 horses running the Grand National that year? Is there a danger that we make too much of the reduced field size? Very possibly, although the fact that there was 40 runners going over these fences was part of its yep. appeal to a lot of people. And I think Chris is right that you're going to be losing out a lot of the more, well, potentially losing out the more interesting stories, aren't you, down towards the bottom. So it could be that they don't necessarily notice the reduction in the field size, but they might notice the reduction in who's taking part in the race. Yeah. You know, it might be, it's a, it's a, you know, four for Mullins, six for Elliot, four for Henry de Bromhead, that, mm -hmm. that, that sort of yeah. thing. So there's, there's less yeah. variety. Oh, you know, there's, these guys seem to have most, it might be that sort of thing. Cause it's mm. going to be a classier race, isn't it? You know, they've, I mean, they've, they've lifted up the bottom racing, for example. Yeah. You know, th those sorts, of things, it's going to be a better race. In and that has been a long-term conscious aim, hasn't it? In terms of the way, they ha the way that Phil Smith started handicapping yep. the race slightly differently, the increased prize money. You, if, you, if you put up a million quid, you would expect to get a classier race. I, th I think that sort of aim goes back a long way, maybe yeah. even back to the sort of the 80s. You know, yeah. there, there was a sort of conscious decision, you yeah. know, can, we, can we upgrade the quality yeah. of horses? That's not and a bad class, thing, No, and classy horses run faster. Well, yeah, yeah, that's the, there's the downside, isn't it? And uh, but that's I think why they felt they had to make the fences a bit more uh, inviting would be one euphemism for it. But then once you've done that, again, they're free to go faster. And, and that's I thought that wasn't hasn't really been covered much. But I thought I think that's an interesting point too, in that the fences have become easier to jump. Yeah. And now that, in one sense, but in most senses, is clearly a very good thing, except in that. A small, smaller fences encourage speed. Yeah. But as you made that point about once you've reduced the field, you can never go back. If clever people in this review had said, well, actually, if we increase the size of the first couple of fences so the horses back off them a bit more, jockeys back off them a bit more, that might be a good idea. You can never go down that line. Absolutely never going to happen. And I, I don't regret the middle being taken out, you know, the timber. No, not core, at all. Because, no. I mean, those rotational falls yes. that we were never. Absolutely. Just awful to look yeah. at and I mean objectively from where we are now it's hard to believe that that was ever thought to be a good idea let's mm -hmm. put a bunch of you know tree logs in the middle of these fences and hope for the best um, I, but you do need the jockeys on side and this is something that I think needs to be worked on um, because in the race that we just saw in April um, there was an awful lot of jockeys heading towards the inside from an early stage in the race and they're you know if everybody does that there just isn't room and they do that because the inside use of the brave man's route with bigger drops at beaches etc but that isn't the case anymore no exactly so you, you don't pay the same no. penalty for going down the under that you, you used to be worried about um, Back in sort of uh, 2013, the first year after they changed the fences, yeah. the year after you know poor synchronised yes. in the race, um, I felt you know across the whole of the sport there was a real focus on you know getting a trouble-free Grand National and yeah. making this work, um, and that was the year I don't you'll remember of course um, they cleared the first seven fences I think yeah. without a single. Yeah. Um, unseated or fallen, yeah. just nothing. Yeah. And, and not only that, but when they all cleared beaches and the commentator said as much, there was a big cheer from the crowd. Yes. I mean, just stuff that's never happened before. They all clear the first seven fences and people are cheering specifically for that. Extraordinary stuff. Um, and we got sort of six years in a row where there were no yeah. fatalities. Um, but I just wonder if, you know, with the passage of time, you know, we, uh, there's, there's some focus somewhere that's been lost that we need to regain, perhaps including the you know jockeys buying in to making sure these races are as safe as they possibly can yeah. be because uh, when i went back and looked at the jockeys that rode in the race this year i think there was only three or four of them who'd been riding 10 years before you know in that atmosphere of 2013 we've had a lot of sort of high profile retirements yeah. since then one reason and another you've got a 
different cohort of jockeys. Um, and, you know, I know that they do talk to them, you know, and they get guys like Ruby Walsh to talk yeah, to them one before riding the race. Now. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think more, evidently more needs to be done to make sure that these guys are giving themselves all the space that they need. Because also, they're the only ones that can control the pace. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, it's, it's a hard thing to do. You can't just introduce a rule or a law or punt out a press release yeah. and make it happen. But you know, that, I think, is where if you could make it work, that's going to make the difference more than anything, really, that they said last week. In terms of the, um, the likelihood that a smaller field grand national will increase the extent to which um, the, the race numerically and in terms of quality is concentrated in a few hands, the jockey club um, considered that in the review process, that idea that, you know, should we do something about the fact that a relatively small number of stables are dominating this race numerically? Yeah. And they ultimately decided it was something for the sport to look at as opposed to the look for the Grand National to deal with directly. Um, it's something we've spoken about on this in the past, and, and Chris, I know something that you've written lots of pieces about in terms of you, you said that you would like to see direct action taken. Yeah. Um, I've said in the past in columns, I've referenced it again today, I wondered if a handful of winning you're in races during the winter might help in that if you win the beacher, if you, I had a particularly bold idea, I'd like to see the, the four mile on New Year's Day revive because that's not going to dip a chase anymore, that card. Of the four mile, and that would be a big centrepiece of New Year's Day, you win your way into the Grand National. Is that something, not that particular race, but just general terms, Pete, winning you're in races, might that help in terms of uh, giving other connections a chance to get in. Now, obviously, the superpass levels might win them as well, but w would that be a helpful move? Well, I mean, the, the problem with the winning, winning, it's a nice idea. Yeah, nice idea. I like idea. your idea. Thank you. Yes, God I can see why you put it in a column, very well read column, Thank I'm you. sure. You're very sweet. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's this review panel, isn't there? Yes. The Grand National Review Panel. So, uh, theoretically, you could have a horse who wins a win in your in race, who gets to the yeah, declaration stage, and they say, well, that yeah. horse don't jump well enough, or yeah. it doesn't. So that, that's a yeah, potential yeah. problem, although yeah. no, not an insurmountable problem. No, you know something. We you don't. If they won a Welsh National or a Four Mile Ranch or a Beach Chase, that they're fine on that front. But yeah, Very possible. Yeah, so yeah. but I don't know. It, it would it would take away greatly from the race if it's the same people, the same colours yeah. winning year in year out. And obviously, there's the point that you made earlier about Manila Times mm. wouldn't have got in the 34 runner race. It would have got in the 34 runner race because JP had five runners in the race, so yeah. and, and they'd have been clever enough to get the horse up. So, do you know what I mean? It's not like it was a, a little like, a stable doing it that way. They, no. they, could have, they could have manipulated it to get the horse <coughs> in. Plainly. If they needed to. I, I know, I, it's, it's, a, it's a strange thought that people might manipulate the handicap system. Um, <laughs> but they, a lot of these changes, I just wonder how much of it's about this appealing to the, they talk so much, the Jockey Club and the BHA, about oh. sort of this, this undecided middle, these people who kind of are open to the Middle idea ground. of it, yeah. I wonder how much of it's about, not about what you think, Chris, because you like the Grand National and you'll go every year, but about people who might think about yeah. buying tickets. Yeah, and, the, and, these, also, and these are all on the path. But also that, that group of people who could, in theory, go either way, in terms of could see the animal rising lot and think, oh, they're, they're talking sense, or they could think, all those million people watching the Grand National, they must be right. I mean, I, I agree with you that that is something that needs to be done. You know, there's like a PR battle that the sport needs to win. Um, but you don't have to cut the field size to do that. You know, that's a really dramatic thing that which we've been resisting doing for 39 years. They, as we saw last week, they had a package of measures which they could easily have presented last week as, you know, being a significant alteration to the circumstances of the race that gave us a, a you know, bigger chance of, you know, happier outcomes in the future. Um, I don't see why this specific change has to be made. I just, I, I worry that some of the impetus for this change within the jockey club has come from people who have no particular love for jump racing in general or the national in particular. Um, and when they see things happen like happened in April, you know, those guys get pretty fed up with the race. You know, OK, it's, it's done us well over the years, providing a ton of money and, and bringing in people um, to, you know, they start by watching the national, don't they? And then they, they grow yeah. to love the rest of the sport. Um, but I think there's some people specifically who are committed to flat racing who could just do without it now. They, they think the race has become a liability. Um, it brings a level of scrutiny and criticism which is applied to the yeah. whole of the sport 
which sort of comes to us through the Grand National. And, and if the National did not exist, I think these people yeah. believe that the criticism would not follow either. And we should say, of course, the Chuck Club would, would not agree with that. So Suley Kavar was in leading the, 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 the communications on this. Um, he's very passionate about the, the, the Grand National. Indeed, job, but I mean, we, we're not going to say that she had the final call on no, all of these changes, that, yeah, you know, she, she would decision. have been a voice yeah. in the okay. discussion. But again, because they haven't produced any kind of detailed report, we don't know exactly, yeah. you know, what was the process or who were the final ar arbiters, you know. Yeah. Um, I guess we need to move on. Um, just, just, just wrapping this, this, this up, um, last year's Grand National, again, millions of viewers, was all over newspapers, loads of betting on the race, mass media coverage, entry was, was still very busy. That ultimately I thought was it was still a positive um, outcome for the race but going forward I'm a glass half full guy generally I'm I'm still I still retain positivity for the for the great race do you retain positivity for the great race well how are we defining positivity well in would the you, sense that you, you've could, talked about would you be confident that if we were having this discuss, discussion in 10 years time mm. we would be talking about a healthy grand national at that point with the future I think we'd be talking about a modified Grand National. Modified from where we are now. Yeah, yeah. I think I think this path to a to a high class mm. staying handicap chase is, is where we're on when we'll have okay. big stables with big prize money and, and doing it that way. And I think that's I think that's the path we're on. Still think there'll be a Grand National, still think people will want to go and you know, there'll still be some some of you know wider mm. appeal, people still want to best and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But um, I think I think more will will come because the race, like Chris says, it invites so much scrutiny that I know people almost feel obliged to think for a little bit. Yeah. Um, You're the same? Well, look, uh, when it comes around again, I'll, I'll try and make the best of it. And, you know, I'm sure there'll be 34 very interesting stories oh. to be told and, and it will still be really hard to pick the winner. Um, so, yeah, uh, we, we hope for the best. I'm afraid it's um, clearly not going to be the race that you and I grew up loving. No. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, what I particularly worry about that is that, um, you know, we're not handing on to the next generation of potential racing fans the same sort of magnet that drew us in. Um, and, you know, I, I feel kind of grateful to the generations before us that they were able to sort of keep it going in the form that it was when, um, when we were young. Yeah, but I guess, again, the alternative point of view is that when we were passed on the Grand National baton, society maybe had different perspectives See, now, than what society I has think now. that card can be overplayed because, you know, I, I found a debate from Hansard just the other day from yeah. the 50s where they were yeah. talking about, the, you know, there's the, people were talking about, is this the right thing? Are we doing the right thing oh. with this race? You know, sometimes bad things happen. Yeah. Um, I, I fear now that um, our leaders are just more likely to, you know, when bad news happens, that, you know, rather than stand up and say, well, look, I can explain this. You know, it's, it's not what you think. You don't quite understand, you know, because, because, because. They, they just sort of run away from public opinion. They say, no, you're right. You're, you're, yes, we should change this. And they also hear public opinion much more through social media. And whether that's a representation of public opinion or it's, just a small group like of people who are very vocal. Big, big megaphone is what yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, and but also, it, I think it encourages groupthink. You could see in the days after the race in April, there was lots of people who sort of b stimulating each other and talking about field size, and it was like a consensus emerged in the days after the national, specifically on Twitter, where people going, "Yeah, it's field size, that's the thing." It was like after the Guineas when you get the fast finishing fourth, and everyone goes, "Oh, that's the Derby winner," <laughs> yeah. and then they get stuffed at Epsom. And they're not always generous, are they? Which <laughs> they're, they're not all talking like generous. Who did? Oh, it's gen yes. no, yes. yes. They're not all the, 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 the majority aren't like that. Gosh, you fished that one out of the. Was that thirty-two years ago? Well, well I was once a young man. Yes, um, it's a bit like the gay trip system. It worked once, yeah. and then everyone remembers it. Yeah. <laughs> um, we should probably move on. Um, before we do move on, I need to tell you that the Racing Post Members Club has a fantastic offer at the moment. You can get your first three months of membership for 50% of the normal price. More details here.
Hi there, our second story this week goes back to Tuesday last week when the British 2024 fixture list was unveiled and Pete Scargill, it wasn't like a normal fixture list unveiling. No, and, and normally this would be the story that we'd be talking about all week. We've got time now. Well, this is it. This is it. But I mean, you know, we, up, Pete, come on. I know, I know. I'm going on and on. It's we have premierisation is is upon us, Lee, or nearly upon yeah. us. So we've got this this revised system where we're going to uh, promote our best races better. We're going to going to showcase them better. We're going to make better use of time and space. So we're going to have less clutter Saturday afternoons. We're going to race on Sunday evenings. We're going to race in the morning sometimes, and the idea is that it's it's going to be great and everyone's going to make lots more money and people aren't going to sell their horses abroad yeah. and that's the ambition so it's size wise it's roughly the same they've, they've shaved a little bit off the edges but the main thing is it's this premierization thrust where we're going to showcase what's best in britain and it's going to be positive out the other end so goes the theory okay um d d you, you you've um, you brought that together very nicely indeed um i guess the overarching question is to you, is it going to work? I don't know. And I don't <laughs> know. I don't know because nobody knows, do they? No, no. no, no one knows. And the BHA have basically admitted, mm. we don't know, but we've got to try. Yeah. That, that's basically their, enough, their yeah. argument is, we don't know what's going to happen, we've got to try. And the arguments are strong enough, which is people are betting less on racing. Yeah. People are going to racing less. There are fewer runners in races, yeah. all stuff that we've reported on extensively in the racing Absolutely. Yeah. And if somebody comes from Hong Kong or America to buy your horse or the Middle East, you say, thank you very much, I'll take that mm -hmm. money because I'm not going to win it in prize money. So, that, and this is causing a, the issue. That doesn't strike me as a very new development, though, has it? I mean, that's, no, no, premiorisation is the new development, Chris. Yeah, so okay. come on, man. But, <laughs> but I don't see that that's going to stop a sort of casual trade in 90-rated horses to Hong Kong, is it? Is it? Well, I suppose what they're saying is that if we can get more money into the top end of the sport and yeah. make these races at these 170 Premier fixtures uh, more competitive, uh, offering deeper purses, then um, your the individual who's selling the horse to Hong Kong might not be as incentivized to do that. Well, I'll believe that when I see it. Well, in terms of what we <laughs> might believe then, um, here's what, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I think. I think that in terms of will this bring more money into the sport, I think it probably will, just because if you spread betting opportunities out over a longer period in the day... More, more money than if they hadn't done anything. Yes, again. yeah. That I think if you spread the betting opportunities out, I think logic dictates that you probably will, because yeah. um, you, you, you're not, in effect, having meetings and races that get overlooked because punters haven't got time to think... But that has to make up for some losses well, elsewhere. Yes, so that... Yeah, that, that's a fair point as well. Um, in terms of... Will this help us tell British racing's top end story better? I have re real reservations because it seems to me that ITV do that anyway. ITV is premierisation in that yeah. in that sense. And unless you dictate to a mainstream broadcaster that you're going to do the, st the sport different and instead of doing 10 races in one programme, you're going to do four races and you're going to have lots of features in between the races so you can tell these stories. That's not that, and they don't, that, that, they don't want that league because the, the sport doesn't want that. Well, no, need, the, how does the sport generate income? It, it generates by income people betting on races. by people betting on races. So you have the, you have levy turnover and you have media yeah. rights, and obviously you have owners putting their money as well. So having four races on ITV and learning about all the stories and like they do around the Breeders' Cup, yeah, you know, all that, that stuff. The, and NBC really end up crying, program. you're crying away at these things like Cody's Wish and all that sort yeah. of stuff. That's no good because you've missed three races that exactly. people could be betting on. And so I mean, I, I don't know. Do you do you feel that? In the end, a lot of this is being driven for betting stuff, isn't it? Sunday, and I think they nobody be, wants to go racing on Sunday no, evening, no. so that's to do with betting. And I think they'd be, and in some ways, I think if you look in some other jurisdictions, say Australia, they are much more comfortable at being perfectly open and saying, we are doing everything here to try and boost betting mm. turnover mm. because we know that's what, what brings money into the sport. Um, the other reservation I've got is that if this, in effect, is a almost like a rebrand, a revamp of the top end of British horse racing. Any revamp or rebrand needs a hell of a lot of cash to be spent on marketing and promoting it. We, we ain't got that. No, and we don't even seem to have a plan about how it's going to be promoted yet. That's Not yet, there's work, work streams, work streams. On Are there? Okay. Which is fine because people yeah. have got to work on it, but it obviously yeah. is October the 16th today. <laughs> um, and New Year's Day is the first day, yeah. isn't it? So 
we need to know relatively soon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and ideally there would be promotion before the thing start. Mm. Like mm. in theory, I yeah. suppose they're not really promoting January racing very heavily, are they? So they. I don't know. You've got Winter Millions, and you've got uh, there's a piece of Marsh Chase. Well, Tommy Whittle, I don't know, he's one of those ones. If there is um, that full mile on New Year's Day at Cheltenham, <laughs> that might that are really good. Um, I tell you, I, I could get on board with premiarisation if I thought it meant more promotion for the Peter Marsh, but yeah. I suspect that was not always the yeah, big aim. I used to love that day. Um, but but my, sorry, so, so the, the other... I mean, I, 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 I get them trying, and I think they've, they've got to try it, and obviously that yeah, well that's it. Down there's there's nothing rubbed. wrong with trying new exactly. things, is there? there? There's a worrying word of the use cascade okay. in... Uh, in one of the documents the BHA put down, the idea that you put more money in the top and it cascades down. Oh, trickle down economics. Uh, yeah. Always yeah. works. Well, Always it, works. This is it. And, and to go back to our Grand National discussion, all the money and intentions going into the top yeah. with the idea that everybody benefits. But don't the people at the top just get more cake? If the cake doesn't get bigger, the people at the top get more cake. <laughs> mm. So, you know, they, like guys like me who have got yeah. horses and small stables with everyday people, unless we get lucky, it's going to be more well, horses for, what for the big stuff. They would it? say is that when people are buying cake, they look at the big, sexy, fancy cakes on the on the top shelf, and when they get into that sort of cake, they then ultimately might start thinking, oh, "I quite like that little flapjack on the bottom level, and we'll have a bit of that." And you're the flapjack. I knew I'd stimulate you with cake. <laughs> Conversations taken on unexpected. Yeah, Sorry. I've rather I've rather lost control of this one. <laughs> and, and, go on, Chris. Just I was just going to say that the, the, I like the word experiment. They've made it yeah. clear this is a two-year thing, yes. and then they'll review um, again. They're, they're doing so many different things; it's going to be hard to pull out cause and effect. But yeah. at least they've committed to the, you know the possibility that we may get to the end of this and go, well, yeah. that was a load of mints. Let's do things how we used to do them. You know, unlike what's happening at Aintree next yeah. year, which and is we, just. Forever, and we shouldn't we shouldn't overlook the fact that British racing does need a major shot in the arm. And if this works, that's a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. You, you do have to try new stuff. Um, this wouldn't have been anywhere in my top ten of ways to reorganise the game, but we're doing it. So let's cross our fingers, right? Yeah, my fingers are crossed all the time on many fronts, including in relation to writing colour pieces about Frankie de Tori's farewell tour, which I seem to have done. <laughs> pretty much every other week through 2024. He had his fingers crossed when he said he was going to retire, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> funny you say that. So, uh, our final story this week, before, actually, we're going to have a little rapid fire round at the end, just to, to don't, Ooh. you know, don't start. I know a lot of you might be a bit bored of the whole Dottori story. Don't be switching off now, there's what? more to come. But, so, Frankie, now, we had, a, we had a special show last week talking about the, the affordability files. Had we not had a special show, I would no doubt have been sat uh, in this chair saying that the previous Saturday at Newmarket on Sun Chariot Day, I went to Newmarket thinking in surprise from the Sun Chariot Sakes, I'm going to write another Frank and Tory story. Um, but it changed slightly. There had been rumours for some time um, mm -hmm. that Frankie was going to spend the early part of next year in California, thereby extending his farewell tour. And very helpfully for a colour writer at Newmarket, John Gosden started talking about how this man isn't going to retire. He ain't packing up yet, he said. He'll carry on into, um, into California, into the Middle East, and then couldn't rely on riding in Britain in the future. Now, whether that flushed out an announcement from Frankie or not, I don't know. But on, on Thursday morning, I was um, uh, dragged from my bed early than expected following uh, a phone call that revealed that Frank Dottori was going to go on BBC Breakfast at 8.45 a.m. and announced that he was going to continue his riding career. That um, was early. Goodness that me. was at 7.22 the phone call came. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do so phones even work at that time of day? Well, I was hoping it mine wouldn't do at that time, but it, but it did do. So uh, um, we, we spoke on Thursday morning, we got a story out pretty quickly, um, and it said more than I think maybe I had been mm. expecting, because not only is Frankie Dottori going to ride in California in January and February, he is becoming a full-time American jockey. But the, the most interesting line in some ways was, it could be three months, could be three years. He isn't, he isn't because he can't rule out riding in Britain in the future, particularly until after Kitco British Champions Day, which has been sold as a farewell mm. to Frankie. Yeah. Surely he'll be riding at Royal Ascot next year, although he can't really talk about that much right now but the the, the 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 thrust of this story 
is that Frank Dottori, the world's most famous jockey, is off to become a full-time American-based rider from the start of 2024. Pete Scargill, discuss. I'm not sure I've got anything to add. <laughs> really? Perfectly summed up, Lee. You are lovely. Perfectly summed up. Well, obviously, everyone had the opportunity to say, I knew this was going to happen. Yeah. Did you know no, it was going to happen? I wrote about it happening, but I didn't know it was going to happen. No. Um, but no, it, no it's, a, it's a relief we've got to this point to some yep. extent because the rumours had just been building and the noise around it was, was deafening, really, yep. wasn't it, to some extent. So it's good that it's come out. It's the only option Frankie left himself, wasn't it? He could only go to California. Yeah, unless he completely changed his mind and... But, but I mean, it's, it was, it's too much of a build-up. He couldn't just go, do you know what, lads? Yeah. I'll see you at Wolverhampton in February. <laughs> yeah. you know, and he's also not... made the point that if he was thinking about now was the time to stop, you almost need to do something completely different anyway, mm. otherwise you're back on the same treadmill doing the same mm. things. Yeah, so the weather's going to be better. Yeah. Um, he's got contacts out there. I am sure if he wanted to, he could do some media stuff with the American yeah. market. They won't turn um, him down. I'm surprised that he's done it in a way he has, that it's sort of been announced. I thought he'd sort of sneak up and there'd be videos on Instagram. Okay. He'd, he'd go about it that way. Um, but I think it was all about the visa, wasn't it? In the end, you know, once it he took a while that to get down, that, yeah. then yeah. you sort of felt free to say stuff. I mean, it's always the way, isn't it? You know, you you can't make a guy sign a contract saying he is going to retire forever. That's it. No. Um, and I'm sure when he announced it, he really felt like doing it. Yeah. And now he feels differently. You know, such is life. If if we're sincere in saying, you know, oh, it would be a great loss to the game, then we've got to be happy that. He's not going to be lost Absolutely. again. He'll still be around. Yeah. And having said that, if he's riding in California, then as far as most of British racing is concerned, you know, he might as well be retired because yeah, we, we're not going to see any of his races. And British racing is probably ready to move on from Frankie to some extent as well. I mean, I think I think the the people involved in it, uh, uh, you know, they've had a year to get used to it, the succession planning and stuff that's gone into place. Yeah. People, you know, from a marketing and the crowd point of view, people will be disappointed they won't get to see doing flying dismounts and what have you. Although, pretty really good for his ankles, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I, mean, I think racing in general is, is ready to say, over here, is ready to say thank yeah. you, Frankie. We don't mind you going off to California. Hey, if you come back to Rascal, that'd be lovely. But well, we, you know, yeah, it's not sure going to be the will. same. Because it, to, yeah, exactly. If, if you're John and Thady Gosden, and you're all Patricia Thompson, and you've got Inspire running in the Queen Anne Stakes on the opening day of Royal Ascot next year, you are surely going to think about putting in a phone call to your friend, Mr. Dettori, to say, would you fancy just popping back for a... <laughs> but, I mean, his absence, as you say, well, that, that gives room for new guys to yeah. come through and new yeah. stars to emerge and for us to form new allegiances yes. and you know a bit more space in the national papers for you know feature interviews about other people for yeah. once um so i think that's interesting and positive for the future yeah. of the sport did he tell you that he, whether he's going to the jungle or not lee he didn't to be fair i didn't ask partly because i was still quite bleary eyed <laughs> and I, I'd, I'd been thinking I'd be having my bowl of old bran, mm. but instead I was, I was doing it. No, he didn't do that. It's I 101, think, isn't it? I mean, he's past well, the post. N n yes, and we should move on in a second. But <laughs> um, I think that was certainly the expectation if we were thinking he was going to finish his riding career in Hong Kong in December. Yeah. But if you're off to do another three year, a full year in America, maybe more oh, than okay. that, does it look a bit off if you're then spending um, two weeks in the jungle with Christopher Biggins or whatever? <laughs> Is it going to be Christopher Biggins? Well, I've no it? idea. Yeah, oh, he might have done it before. It's I think. a fair point. And how do they introduce him? You know, Frankie Dottori, a jockey who is not yeah. yet retired. Um, yeah, I, 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 I maybe not. Wonder. Maybe not. Find out, Lee. I, I yeah. baffles me that anybody wants to sign up for that show and you yes. know, spend two weeks eating cockroaches or whatever it is that they do. Yeah. I'd much rather let the chow chow chow. Anyway. <laughs> We should move on. Rapid fire. Ra this is a completely new um, addition to the front page. We've never done this before. But we've never had a week. It's bound like to we go well. Then. <laughs> bound to go well. Cross your fingers. So, um, who wants to go first in saying a few words about City of Troy in the duos? Pete, you were there. I was there. He was uh, magnificent. Yeah. Um, I felt that he was allowed to control the race slightly. Yep. Um, he, he does have an ability. He's one of these horses that that, that kills others with his mid race speed. He's just he's really fast and able to maintain that acceleration so uh, I was very impressed um, he's a horse who seems to have all the right temperaments and um, attributes to be a very good horse and he'll look very good finishing second to Rosalian in the guineas next oh year. Chris there you go I mean I really appreciate the way that they 
um, ramped up the, the chat, especially Michael He's Tabor. He's Frankel since yeah, Michael Tabor. And, and then he sort of he says, we might all have egg on our faces. And, um, I mean, you go back, what, eight years was it to Air Force Blue? One that you heard and Aiden was saying, this is yeah. undeniably the best two-year-old yeah. we've ever had. Yeah. And um, maybe it was true, but he oh. wasn't a very good three-year-old. No. Um, you can't be sure, can you? There's, there's, I, I don't know if anybody's worked out how you can tell which of those two-year-olds are definitely going to hold their form to the next year and still be dominant. Yeah. Um, but it, it feels like the Guineas build-up has already started, and we're going to get to that first week in May with that sort of you know, yeah. electricity of, you know, is he actually that good still, yeah. or uh, you know, are things all about to go the shape of the pair? It, it really adds to something when you've got a horse who's potentially great, but yeah, you can't just it? assume that he's past the post. Doesn't it? More about Frankel shortly. Um, I adored City of Troy on Saturday. I adored him in the superlative stakes. I adored Ace Impact in the arc. We ain't going to see him again. Huge surprise, that one. Yeah. Oh. Um, well, I mean, I, I guess talks. He, he's, yeah, he's got, got to the point where he's just so blooming valuable. Yeah. Um, you and I can sit here and say, you know, if he were mine, I'd carry on racing him. And I, I really do think that's true in my case. You know what mm. I mean? Yes, there's a big bag of money there, but also, you how, how many yeah. other chances are you going to have to have a horse well, like Well, exactly. Um, and uh, again, there, there's a sort of responsibility on the media, I think. You've always got to learn from these things. That if we talk up a horse too early, then this is the consequence. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's at least partly reputation that creates his value. Um, and we do have to make the point always that unless a horse comes back at four and proves they can give weight and a beating yeah. to the three-year-olds, then there's still something to prove, and he yeah. didn't do that. He had a lot to prove, didn't he, in that sense? He did. I mean, he was, he was brilliant in the Ahak, and he was brilliant in the, in the Jockey Club. I mean, he's clearly an extremely talented horse. Yeah. But he did only start racing at the start, start of the year, year, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, which, is, which is a shame. And I don't, I, I, I don't know career. how much there was about it, but it's almost a bit like Flight Line. It's almost this, they've got, they're unbeaten, and, and mm. I don't get this cult of a horse has to be unbeaten to be the best. I, I don't... I don't understand. I don't, maybe it started with Frankel. I don't know, but if a horse is unbeaten, it's everything to ma maintain that status. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know if you can maintain the status, then your horse is great. And if you get beaten, uh, you're not you're not so great anymore. I, 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 I don't get it. I don't get it. Of course they do. Come back. And, Absolutely. My, my admiration always goes to those horses that just turn up for the big race because yeah. it's the big race, and it doesn't matter if the circumstances are favourable or not. And they get yeah. beaten a few times, but they always turn up and run honestly. Those are the horses worth treasuring, I think. Absolutely. Uh, if we talk about big money, then Martin Crudis, the ARC chief executive, wrote a letter to the DCMS uh, Secretary of State, Culture Secretary, um, Lucy Fraser, last week, uh, Chris, in which he uh, spoke about the danger um, that affordability checks, formalised affordability checks, um, place on horse racing and predicted a cost to the sport of £250 million over five years. It takes the story on, this long running story, uh, to an extent. So the big question is, will the government listen? Yeah, um, <laughs> that is the big question. Uh, God knows they've got no excuse for not knowing oh. the potential consequences now for, you know, for our sport, for our industry. Um, and it's you know, about time that they did something about it. You know, I, I think of horse racing as natural Tory heartland. Um, you would think that by now we would have their full attention. Yeah. Um, but I don't see any sign of white smoke yet. I don't see anybody riding to the rescue, no. unfortunately. I mean, they, perhaps they're just sort of rabbits caught in the headlight, you know, because things are not going politically all that brilliantly for them at the moment. And no, uh, they, they, they seem to think they need to turn around the economy to have any chance at the next election. And maybe they just can't think beyond that. Um, but, you know, we, we need help from the corridors of power imminently. Yeah, yeah. Martin was saying that they should pause the introduction of affordability, which, which seems sensible in, in, the, in the sense that we still don't know yet if we can have frictionless affordability checks, but... But to do that, somebody's got to sort of get yeah. the shepherd's crook on the gambling commission. Absolutely, and, and uh, yeah, and that, that, that doesn't sound like an easy process, that gambling commission. Again, last week, just, just quickly, um, uh, Pete, um, Philip Davis, Torrin P, spoke about an FOI request that went into the gambling commission asking it to uh, reveal the substance of a previous consultation, and they basically refused to do it. Well, this is it. I mean, uh, quite a few people have, had, have put in freedom of information requests. Yeah, when we, yeah. And and they're they're a difficult <laughs> they're a difficult organisation to to get any information out of, you know, because you know they're in they're in the glare at the moment and yeah. being scrutinised like never before. A lot of the time, as you found out with the affordability files, 
because you ask them a straight question you don't and you answer. get, well, no answer or a roundabout answer. So, yeah. look, it's um, the thing with the, the, the letter, just quickly, is that, that there's been a lot of talk about racing not putting its case across strongly enough or more often enough. So it's good that something has been put out and, you know, made clear on that front to, yeah. to put racing's um, situation forward, you know. I want to finish with one last link. Talking about, you ask a question to the Gambling Commission, they don't give you an answer. We asked you a question. We asked you, who was your favourite racehorse of all time? Who is the people's champion? And it could have been in terms of the final, Desert Orchid, Red Rum, Corto Star, Demon or Frankel. It was Frankel. Chris, were you surprised? Um, yeah, a bit. I, uh, I would have thought the framing of the, the thing, a people's champion, leads you directly to either Red Rum or Desert Orchid, doesn't it? But yeah. there may have been an element of the jump vote being split because you've got four jumpers mm. and one flat horse. And so, I mean, yeah, people could say, Franco won, he beat all your old slow chasers. Um, but on the, another way of looking at it is there was a 73% vote for a jumper to one yeah. kind or another to win that race. I think as well as um, someone who primarily, predominantly uh, more slightly more jumps than, than, than flat, um, these things tend to have a lot of recency bias. And sure. I was just actually quite encouraged that Red Rum and Desert Orchid, given that they ran in the, mainly the 70s and 80s, that they actually did so well in something that was largely framed around a, uh, so social media um, followers. You know, the fact that they still polled so well shows you what an impact they made. And in terms of Frankel's victory, Frankel's entourage camp and the people that nominated Frankel all made clear they were voting for Frankel, but they were voting for Frankel well, and Sir Henry Cecil. The, 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 story, the story around Frankel was wonderful, wasn't it? Yeah. it and as as yeah. told by you and your piece, I could tell when you were speaking with everybody how much it still yeah. resonates, even if Frankel can't eat a carrot properly. OK, at this point then, we always say who has had the winning story. As we said, massive week of stories. Uh, Frank Dettori, Fixulist and the Grand National. But Chris, the Grand National is the world's most famous horse race. It has to be the winning story, doesn't it? Uh, well, I would think so, yeah. Yeah, well, it is. E even though you never let me win, so this would be a first well, you time. you have I've this Managed week. not to miss the goal on yeah, this occasion. You can, you can get rid of your anger and bitterness now. Well, it was a little no, bit no, more than that, time mate. Getting rid, of, getting rid of some views. So, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't have done a quick, we couldn't have done it on 18 pack, could we? No. If, after no. all that. So, and, yeah. you know, so the, the director is no doubt frustrated that we've been talking for so long about the Grand National. It has to be the winning story. He wants us to stop. We must stop now. So, Chris Cook. Pete Scargill, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week. Until then, bye-bye.